Hi, it's Katrina. Today, we'll delve into some of the most mysterious hidden places on the planet. Some of these places were so high up in the sky, you would risk your life just trying to get there. Or they were covered by sand dunes or carved into cliffs to hide from invaders. But now, thanks to drones and even earthquakes, we can now see many new ancient secrets. Let's take a look and then you can let me know which place you would like to visit in the comments. Chapel in the Sky Have you ever wanted to scale a mountain and face certain death to get to a monolithic church? I haven't, but for those of you who would risk it, you'll have to travel to Ethiopia. Known as Abuna Yematagu, this place is, quite literally, a chapel in the sky. It's located in the Garalta Mountains at a height of 8,464 feet and it's carved right into the side of a rocky cliff. Although this place is now widely known, not many make the journey to the chapel. I mean, imagine being the first person to discover the church. You're looking for some adventure, so you decide to climb up a mountain, where you see what could be a cave at the very top. You narrowly avoid slipping and falling several times, but eventually you make it to the cave. However, when you enter the cavern, you see that it's not a cave at all. It's a church. Inside, it's decorated with beautiful and vibrant paintings in near-perfect condition. You may not know it, but the lack of humidity and dry air preserved these paintings, keeping them in their original state of glory. You almost died to get there, but that's by design. The church builders picked this location as a way to be closer to God. Ethiopia is an extremely religious place, with nearly 50% of the population considering themselves to be Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. There's no easy way to reach the church. There are no stairs or elevators. In fact, it's arguably one of the most inaccessible places of worship on the planet. To get there, you have to climb on foot. But be careful if you make the journey, because even if you reach the church, it's surrounded by a drop of 650 feet on every side. It's named after Father Abuna Yamata, a 5th century priest. He and his followers supposedly carved the chapel out of the stone and it sat undisturbed for centuries, only being visited by wandering monks and Christians. The frescoes seem to depict figures from the Old and New Testament, themed around the Twelve Apostles and the Nine Saints. The most ancient things you'll find here are in the form of triptychs and diptychs, works of art with either two or three panels. They date back over 500 years, completed sometime in the 15th century. Climbing the cliff is seen as an act of faith, and reaching the chapel is your reward. Despite this difficult task, it's said that Father Abuna Yamata worshipped at the church every Sunday. Talk about commitments, and he must have been a very good rock climber. Vardzia Around 900 years ago, one of the most impressive cave cities in the world was built into a cliffside, shielding it from outsiders. That is, until an earthquake revealed it, leaving it vulnerable to Ottoman invaders. This place was hidden extremely well until then, with only one entrance through a secret tunnel. And it's still well hidden today, as it's incredibly hard to get to. It's situated at an altitude reaching over 4,200 feet. The Bronze Age city of Vardzia is nestled on the slopes of Eru Sheti Mountain in Georgia. It was initially built as a defensive fortress during King Georgi III's reign in the 12th century. It flourished under the leadership of his daughter, Queen Tamar, later evolving into a bustling monastic complex and cultural hub. Vardzia isn't really connected all that well to the rest of the country, so if you plan to visit, you'll need to make arrangements in one of its small neighboring cities. And if you're an English speaker, good luck trying to find someone you can communicate with. You'll either need to find an English-speaking tour guide or travel with someone who speaks Georgian. Vardzia sprawls across more than a quarter of a mile and is comprised of 13 levels. Originally built completely underground, this place once had over 6,000 apartments and 2,000 resident monks. Queen Tamar was said to occupy 366 apartments, constantly changing her residence to avoid detection. It's like when modern elites build bunkers in the event of a global cataclysm. If an asteroid hits or war reaches their doorstep, they can slip away to their bunker, where they're safe from harm. This place kept the people of Vardzia isolated, allowing them to hide from the Ottomans and other potential threats. 
But if this place was underground, carved into solid stone, where did they get their food? Well, the architects of Vardzia were smart. They created a sophisticated irrigation network. They channeled water from the mountain to sustain the city's inhabitants and agricultural terraces. And this ensured that the people had food and never went thirsty. Seems like a pretty nice place to live, right? Well, it was, at least until 1283, when a devastating earthquake exposed the city. The inhabitants were going about their day as usual when suddenly the earth began to tremble. Stones cracked and their cave ceilings crumbled, revealing the blue sky above. This must have been quite a shock, especially to people who had lived their whole lives underground. No longer sheltered, Vardzia was left wide open for attack, and the ensuing conflicts with the Ottoman invaders left the city ravaged, leading to its eventual abandonment in the 16th century. Not everyone left, though. Despite the adversities, a few resilient monks stayed behind, maintaining a semblance of Vardzia's legacy. The Soviet era between 1922 and 1991 witnessed renewed interest in the cave city. And now, ongoing excavation efforts and partial restoration endeavors breathe new life into the ancient complex. They want to return this place to its original state because it's now considered to be one of the oldest and most impressive cave cities in the world. Who wants to visit? Skara Bray one of the most perfectly preserved villages dating back to the Stone Age in Europe is known as Skara Bray. For hundreds of years, this place was covered by a sand dune in Scotland, on the shore of the Bay of Skyle. Located on the Orkney Islands, it was exposed by a storm in 1850. You'd think that the storm would reduce this place to rubble, but its structures were found in remarkable condition. Even the furniture was found completely intact probably because everything in the village was carved out of stone. The well-preserved state of Skara Bray fascinated archaeologists. So, in the 1860s, William Watt led the charge to uncover the secrets of this place. He initially only discovered four buildings, but a storm in 1926 revealed even more. Fast forward to the disco-loving 70s, and radiocarbon dating revealed that Skara Bray's ancient origins were from 3200 BC to 2200 BC. The dwellings in this village stand 8 feet tall, and yet nothing was placed between the stones to hold them together. All these years later, and they are still standing, almost as if by magic. So what exactly is going on here? In reality, the architects of this place were beyond their time. They knew that the drift sand carried by the wind would fill the spaces between the rocks, preserving them in place. The village was made up of several of these dwellings, each one in the shape of a rectangle but with rounded corners. The ancient inhabitants of this place would enter their homes through a narrow doorway, which they could close with a hefty rock slab. These people were living like the Flintstones, but they probably didn't keep dinosaurs as pets. That would be really cool though. When the village was suddenly abandoned around 2200 BC, it was made up of seven or eight huts connected by paved pathways. Six of these huts were buried partly underground, surrounded by a mixture of sand, peat ash, and waste, creating mounds called middens. Building their huts this way was pretty genius. It made their houses stable and insulated them from Orkney's harsh winter climate. The alleys between the huts eventually turned into tunnels with roofs made of stone slabs. The entire living area was also designed with a sewage system, collecting waste from each hut and channeling it into a central sewer. It likely didn't smell great, but hey, at least they weren't relieving themselves in buckets and throwing their waste directly onto the street like they were in medieval England. These people were farmers. Tending to herds of sheep and cattle, they likely lived off the meat from their animals as well as whatever they caught in the ocean. Relying exclusively on local materials for their equipment, like beach pebbles, stone, and animal bones, the villagers made pottery with elaborate decorations. The inhabitants of Skara Bray also had a keen sense of style, creating pendants of colored beads that they made from the bone marrow of sheep, the teeth of killer whales, or the roots of cow's teeth. There is also evidence that they played games here, with artifacts being discovered like walrus ivory dice and knuckle bones. What may surprise you is that this current village is only half of it. Archaeologists have discovered that underneath the foundations and walls of the existing stone huts are even older structures. 
These lower levels were built using the same material as the upper levels, decorated with incised and relief designs. One motif in particular, called the True Spiral, is the only example of this pattern that's known in prehistoric Britain. It was discovered in the lower level of one of these huts, engraved into a shard of ceramic. The Mysterious Sphinx Deep in the heart of Egypt's Giza Plateau stands the Great Sphinx. This colossal monument has stood guard for millennia, but its origins are steeped in mystery. So, what secrets could it be hiding? About six miles west of Cairo, near the banks of the Nile River, the Great Sphinx commands attention. Its majestic form, carved from the bedrock of the plateau, reaches a staggering height of approximately 66 feet and stretches an impressive 240 feet in length. A masterpiece of ancient craftsmanship, the Sphinx is believed to embody the strength and power of the lion, gazing toward the eastern horizon where the sun emerges to herald a new day. We could talk about the mysterious origins of the Sphinx, whether it was made under the rule of Pharaoh Khufu or if it's far more ancient. But today, we are going to go deeper, literally. We're going to discuss what could be hidden under the Sphinx. Under the monument are several tunnels and passages. These channels were created over thousands of years, and some even believe that somewhere under the Sphinx is the fabled Hall of Records. This is supposedly a library that contains all the secrets of the ancient world. But this hasn't been proven, at least as far as we know. Maybe this library really does exist, but it's been hidden from the public. It's not a stretch to consider, especially since civilians are prohibited from exploring these hidden tunnels. So where does this theory come from? On his YouTube channel, amateur historian Matt Simpson referenced a book called Operations Carried On at the Pyramid of Giza in 1837. It was allegedly written by Colonel Howard Weiss, a 19th century Egyptologist. And in it, Weiss claims that through several reports and rumors in Egypt, he came to believe there was a secret door hidden beneath the Sphinx. He says that French engineers were excavating quite a bit when they found the door. Okay, so maybe there's a door, but where does it lead? Weiss writes that the door led into the body of the Sphinx. He even claimed that people who were part of the excavation affirmed that the door led to a vast tunnel system connecting all of the pyramids and the Sphinx together. If what Vice claims is true, it would be one of the most incredible discoveries of all time. But the secrets don't end there. In Vice's book, he also speaks of three massive stone slabs called stelae that were originally in front of the Sphinx. One of them is known as the Dream Stela, supposedly built between 1479 and 1425 BC. This slab is still at the site today, but the other two were supposedly shipped off to the Louvre in Paris in the 19th century. And since then, little has been spoken of them. Matt Sibson supposedly came across a picture of one of the two missing stelae in Weiss's book. In an interview with the Daily Star, he says that the slab is engraved with the likeness of the Sphinx on top of a platform. According to him, it looks like the Sphinx is resting on what seems to be a doorway. The Dream Stela, the only remaining stele at the site, also shows a door underneath the Sphinx, backing up Vice's claims. But what does the other stele show? Unfortunately, that's a mystery at the moment. Until the stone slab is reanalyzed and brought back to life, it looks like the secrets of the Sphinx remain hidden. And if there is a tunnel system underneath the monument, what treasures could it hold? Ise Grand Shrine there is a hidden gem in Japan that you'll never be able to visit. In the middle of a sacred forest, there is a shrine that was built over 2,000 years ago. Known as the Ise Grand Shrine or Ise Jingu, this place is dedicated to the solar goddess Amaterasu. You can get pretty close to the shrine, but it's strictly off limits to enter, unless you're a priest or part of the imperial family. The commoners are restricted by a wooden fence, leaving them to wonder what the inside looks like. Initially built in 4 BC, it's since been restored and rebuilt. This place is more than just one shrine, though. It's a sprawling complex made up of 125 buildings, and 16 of those structures are rebuilt every 20 years, 
including features like the Uju Bridge and the Tori Gateway. The gateway stands at the entrance of the complex, symbolically representing the transition from the mundane to the sacred. However, the bridge is less symbolic. It's just a bridge, but it's unclear why it requires updating every two decades. Ise Grand Shrine is the ancestral shrine of Japan's emperors. Looking at this place, you'll likely picture samurai and get flashes of scenes from Mulan. You may be tempted to take pictures to show your friends back home, but that's off limits. This rule is strictly policed, and you could be fined or even jailed for breaking it. I don't even know what I'm going to show you in this video. Amazingly, the shrine was constructed without the use of a single nail. Instead, the buildings were made using cypress logs and kaya grass for the roofs. This method is still used when structures are rebuilt every 20 years, and some of the logs used in construction are from 400-year-old trees, which only adds to the sacredness of the site. This place holds some treasure as well. It is said to house a holy object known as the Sacred Mirror. You might be thinking, that's it? Just a mirror? Well, mirrors and fairy tales do a lot of things. And the mirror has a backstory. It supposedly represents honesty or wisdom, depending on the source. In ancient Japan, mirrors symbolized truth because they reflected what was shown. They were considered to be objects of reverence and mystique. Is this reminding anyone of Snow White? The sacred mirror was allegedly forged by an ancestral deity, and eventually the mirror was handed over to the Imperial House of Japan. A fire in the year 1040 was said to have burned the compartment where the mirror was held, but whatever remains of the mirror is kept in this shrine. Secrets in the Amazon Rainforest all right, folks, buckle up because we are diving into the heart of the Amazon rainforest. Hidden beneath the lush canopy like buried treasure waiting to be found are not one, not two, but two dozen ancient settlements. The discovery was made in 2023 by a team of researchers from the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, and they could hardly believe what they found. We are talking about structures that were built way before Columbus ever sailed the ocean blue. These villages are like time capsules from the past, built by indigenous people who once called the Amazon home. These constructions aren't your run-of-the-mill buildings. These are ancient towns, fortified villages, ceremonial structures, and even riverbank sites all tucked away in the depths of the forest. But if these places are so well hidden, how did we ever find them? This discovery was thanks to some cutting-edge tech called LiDAR. This fancy gadget lets scientists peek through the thick forest canopy and create 3D models of what lies beneath. It's like having X-ray vision for the rainforest. Among the jaw-dropping discoveries is a type of settlement known as a plaza town. Imagine big ditches, circular plazas, and straight roads, like something straight out of a history book. And get this, the researchers predict that there could be anywhere from 10,000 to 24,000 more of these ancient sites just waiting to be uncovered in the Amazon. But why is all of this important? Well, it turns out that these indigenous people were pros at managing the forest and cultivating plants. Their techniques have even left a mark on the ecology of the modern Amazon. You can think of them as the original environmentalists, peacefully coexisting with nature. They incorporated the rainforest into their settlements, instead of chopping down trees to make room for their buildings like we do today. So while the Amazon might seem like an untouched wilderness, it's actually full of ancient wonders that have yet to be fully explored. While these settlements have been identified using LiDAR, we still have a long way to go before researchers can make it to these sites and actually analyze them on the ground. The rainforest is still full of danger. There are jaguars, anacondas, highly toxic poison dart frogs, and flesh-eating piranhas. They could be lurking around any turn, so finding someone willing to put their life on the line in the name of research is extremely difficult. Who wants to go in with a machete these days? But hopefully in the future, these ancient places will be revealed in more detail to the public, and we'll learn more about the mysterious builders. Cave of the Crystals In the year 2000, miners searching for ore deposits near Nica, Mexico, discovered a place that looks straight out of a fairy tale. Imagine that you're strolling through a dark cave. Then, suddenly, you come across a cavern filled to the brim with giant crystals. You might rub your eyes and think you were hallucinating at first, but this place is 100% real. 
The miners found themselves surrounded by massive white crystals in the horseshoe-shaped cave. Gleaming pillars of gypsum that were as big as telephone poles were illuminated by the miners' lights jutting out in all directions from the brown limestone floors, walls, and ceiling. The Cave of the Crystals, as it's appropriately been named, is nestled 950 feet underground. The cavern is located inside Nika Mountain, which is rich in silver, lead, and zinc. Since the mining company Industria Spinoles discovered the cave, it's been filled with researchers from all over the globe. The scientific mystery and rare beauty of this place are just too incredible for them to pass up. Crystallographer, yes, that's a real thing, Juan Manuel Garcia Ruiz from the University of Granada traveled to the cave all the way from Spain just to see these crystals with his own eyes. He'd been growing crystals in laboratory flasks since he was 15 years old, so walking around the cavern was like a dream come true. He said that when he first entered the cave, he burst out laughing because, in his own words, he was euphoric. In the years since the cave was found, researchers like Garcia Ruiz have braved the cavern's hot and humid conditions in search of answers regarding the crystal's origin. They also hope to discover the reason for their monumental growth. But two decades and some change later, many of these mysteries have been solved. So the main focus now is how to protect and preserve this place for future generations. About 26 million years ago, magma funneled upward through the earth underneath southeastern Chihuahua, Mexico. This climbing magma eventually created what's now a mountain that's located near the town of Nica. Simultaneously, the magma forced scorching, mineral-rich waters into gaps and caverns within the mountain's limestone. And it was in these waters that the gypsum crystals were born. Within the cave was water infused with calcium sulfate, which can form several different types of minerals. But it just so happened that gypsum, or more specifically, a translucent, colorless type of gypsum called selenite, came to be the main mineral in the caves. I should mention that this cave isn't the only cavern in Nika that's filled with gypsum crystals. However, no other cave in the world could compare to the massive crystals found within the Cave of the Crystals. It seems as though this cavern just happens to be in the Goldilocks zone for growing minerals to monumental proportions. Unfortunately though, if you were planning to pack your bags and travel to Mexico to take a look at this place, I have some bad news. The cave is closed to the public as it's located inside the Nika mine, and it's for researchers only. Shi Cheng, the Lion City. Now hold your breath because we're going underwater. Hidden beneath the waves in China is the incredible ancient city of Shi Cheng. The name translates to Lion City, which sounds like a place you might find in a video game. But what does this Chinese city have to do with lions? Well, it was named after the nearby Wu Shi Mountain, which means Five Lion Mountain in English. Looking at pictures of this place, you may find it odd how well preserved everything is. Buildings are intact, and you can see every detail on the motifs that decorate the structures. But it's underwater, so something terrible must have happened here, right? Maybe an earthquake, or perhaps a giant wave washed over this place, submerging it completely. But that's just not the case. In reality, Lion City was purposely flooded by the Chinese government. Lion City is nearly 1400 years old, so you would assume that China would want to leave this place as untouched as possible, but they did the exact opposite, covering the entire place with water in order to accommodate the Xin'an hydroelectric dam. 300,000 people lived in the city up until 1959, when everyone was forced to move. And they didn't really have a choice. They could either relocate or be swallowed by the Qiandao Lake like the rest of the city. You'd think the sinking of an entire city would make Shi Cheng well remembered by the people of China. But it was actually mostly forgotten about until 2001, when the Beijing Dragon Diving Club rediscovered the place. In near perfect condition, members of the club found intricate carvings, arches, guardian lions, as well as full buildings and temples at a depth of about 130 feet. Since it was submerged, it's been protected from rain, wind, and sun damage. But what about water damage? Apparently, that wasn't something the Chinese government cared about. Shi Cheng was constructed during the Tang Dynasty in 621 AD. And based on ancient records of the region's history, the city is quite large. 
Spanning an area that's bigger than 60 football fields, the city was unique as it was built with five gates and towers as opposed to the typical four. It contains 265 archways and is surrounded by city walls that date back to the 16th century. If you didn't know anything about Shi Cheng and visited Qiandao Lake, you'd never even know there's an ancient city concealed within its depths. Although this place is open to the public, there are very few dive operators that run trips to the lake. It's not impossible to visit, it just takes a bit of planning. However, even if you do dive down to Lion City, you're not likely to see much. Visibility is extremely low at 130 feet, dropping to a mere 6 inches, in some places, towards the bottom of the lagoon. But anyway, if you're a diver and you want to go, go for it! And then be sure to tell us all about it! The Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion the legendary Ark of the Covenant is said to be stored in a church in Ethiopia. You know, one of the most sacred religious relics of all time? It's said to be a giant golden chest that supposedly carries the Ten Commandments. But as fate would have it, only a few people are allowed to enter this holy place. Built in the 4th century, the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion is located in Aksum, Ethiopia. But this place is harder to get into than a VIP section of a nightclub in Vegas on a Saturday night. Archaeologists and historians are prohibited from investigating the chapel. Guards make sure that nobody enters the building who isn't a member of the church. They're kind of like bouncers, shooing away unwanted guests and curious tourists. But that doesn't really give you an accurate picture of who these guys are. Apparently, these religious bouncers are actually monks. So that changes things a bit, doesn't it? Whether or not the Ark of the Covenant is really inside this church is up for debate. After all, nobody is allowed inside to confirm or deny this other than members of the church. It seems strange that they would keep this ancient relic all to themselves, but it does sort of make sense. Important artifacts like this have a habit of going missing once they are moved for examination. And if they really have what they say they do, you can understand why they don't want everyone looking at it and touching it. For now, only those allowed inside the church know for sure. So, until more evidence is presented to the public, one can only hope they're telling the truth. What do you think? Do you think they have the Ark of the Covenant? Let me know in the comments! The Dome of the Rock There is a building in Jerusalem that's topped with a golden ball. Well, it's not so much as a ball as it is a gold-plated domed roof. This place is known as the Dome of the Rock, and it's more exclusive and holier than the Temple Mount. On the outside, the building is intricately decorated with vibrant blue and green patterns, so it really stands out against the desert landscape. It's supposedly the oldest surviving work of Islamic architecture, and it contains the earliest proclamations of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Until the mid-20th century, the only people permitted in the area were Muslims. Non-Muslims were given limited access in 1967. However, if you're not Muslim, you aren't permitted to pray, wear religious apparel, or bring prayer books to the site. This is strictly enforced by the Israeli police. It's so hard to get into that a photographer from National Geographic took two years of negotiations before they could even set foot on the premises. The location of the Dome of the Rock is believed to be mentioned in the Quran, so it's considered extremely holy by the people of Israel. It's supposedly the place where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven. So, while non-Muslims are allowed in the Temple Mount, they aren't allowed to step foot inside the Dome of the Rock. That means that no Christian has ever set foot inside this place and seen the inside with their own eyes. But the inside of the building is arguably the best part. The interior of the building is so amazing that it rivals the Sistine Chapel. Held up by eight main pillars, the Dome of the Rock is almost entirely covered in complex geometric patterns and complicated mosaics. Every detail is perfectly designed and implemented. Ancient Settlements of the Arabian Desert Looking at the Arabian Desert, you'd never guess that people once lived there, but apparently it was once inhabited by thousands of people. In the middle of what's now the unforgiving Nefu Desert in the Arabian Peninsula lies a secret buried beneath the sands. Recent revelations seem to suggest that this seemingly barren land was once a thriving oasis, teeming with life and lush greenery. 
Discovered by a research team, evidence of 46 ancient lakes scattered throughout the desert has unveiled a forgotten chapter of human history. For a long time, the Arabian Peninsula was thought to be an inhospitable wasteland and nothing more. But now, researchers have revealed it to be an important hub for early humans making their exodus from Africa. The Paleo Deserts Project, which was launched in 2013, set out on a journey to explore the shifting landscapes of Arabia. They plan to discover its significance in the human story. And what do you think they found? They discovered evidence of a series of Green Arabia events triggered by celestial hiccups. And these so-called hiccups transformed the desert into a tropical paradise attracting early human settlers. Using satellite imagery and sediment cores, researchers uncovered traces of ancient civilizations along the shores of these dried-out lakes. Ancient tools dating back 1.8 million to 250,000 years ago suggest that intelligent people lived there who could handle changes in the environment. They went deep into the desert. They didn't just inhabit the edges, which is different from what we used to think. I mean, without evidence, who would ever imagine that people were living in this barren wasteland? The routes taken by these ancient migrants remain a mystery, yet evidence suggests two main pathways one through the Horn of Africa, and another through the Sinai Peninsula. Though no human remains have been unearthed, the sophistication of their stone tools mirrors that of their Eastern African counterparts. As the climate changed between wet and dry periods, the resilience of these ancient people was tested. But how did they survive when faced with hardships? And what secrets lie buried beneath the shifting sands of time? The cyclical nature of green Arabia hints at a future where the desert blooms once more. However, the impact of modern climate change remains uncertain. In other words, the desert might have been on track to go green again until things started going south. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Ancient Roman Sanctuary There is a mysterious place called the Lapis Niger Sanctuary hidden beneath the city of Rome. In Latin, it translates roughly to black stone. The place was first discovered in 1899 underneath the Ark of Septimius Severus. Excavations revealed a square of black pavement and underneath the subterranean chamber from the 6th century BC. It contained fragments of animal bone, deposits of gravel, small idols, and evidence of sacrifices. Back then, the sanctuary had likely been used for cult worship. What kind of cult and what kind of worship is still unknown. What's really fascinating is that the Imperial Romans also thought the Black Stone Sanctuary was of great importance. They believed the Black Stone marked an unlucky spot. They believe the underground sanctuary was supposed to serve as Romulus's grave, Romulus being one of the founding fathers of Rome. But this never happened, and it was instead his foster father, Faustulus, who was buried here instead. The truth is that the Romans had already forgotten what the sanctuary was used for by the time they had become a republic. It just kind of became a dark and foreboding place. And in the end, they covered it and forgot it completely. Viking Boat Graves the Valsgard burial ground was used for over 1,000 years, with the elite members of Viking society being buried here continuously for at least eight centuries. It began as a Viking burial ground for ordinary folk, and by the time it stopped being used, it had become reserved for the highest echelon of Swedish society. The site itself consists of boat graves, unique Viking-style burials in which people were entombed inside massive boats. At least 92 graves have been found here, the majority of them from the Vendel period of 550 to 750, and the Viking Age of between 750 to 1100. But not all of them are in boats. Some were just stuffed into burial pits, and some weren't even human. Many people buried here were discovered alongside the skeletons of dogs, suggesting a very close relationship between the ancient Vikings and their canine friends. Island of Gold In Indonesia, divers have discovered the lost location of the mysterious Island of Gold. While local divers were splashing around in the Musi River looking for treasure at the bottom, they discovered tons of gold rings and shiny beads. These sparkling treasures likely came from the Srivijaya Empire, a great group of people who controlled sea trade across massive stretches of Asia for about 400 years, between the 7th and 11th centuries. 
According to maritime archaeologist Sean Kingsley, coins, pieces of gold, and gems had been turning up randomly throughout the last five years. This led locals to believe there was some kind of treasure at the bottom of the river leaking onto the shores. And sure enough, they were 100% right. They've so far discovered heaps of precious gems, giant bells from destroyed temples, mirrors, and musical instruments shaped like peacocks. But how did it all get to the bottom of the river? The kingdom had its capital located on an island in the river. This allowed them to control all the trade goods coming into the Malay archipelago and moving in and out of China and India. It was also a Buddhist sanctuary, with reports from the 7th century citing over 1,000 Buddhist monks living in the city. But like every ancient civilization, this one had to come to an end eventually. They seemingly vanished overnight almost 1,000 years ago, but we don't actually know what happened to them. Because their city was literally on an island in the river, basically floating on rafts, we have very little evidence to go on. They may have been destroyed by their rivals, wiped out by an earthquake, or something even worse. What do you think happened to the mysterious residents of the great floating island of gold? Let me know any theories you have in the comments below. Last Roman Gladiator Arena the last Roman gladiator arena ever built has been found somewhere you probably wouldn't have guessed. It was discovered in Switzerland. Archaeologists recently uncovered the ruins of a Roman amphitheater that had been used to host gladiator fights and animal hunts. To make matters exceptionally bizarre, the gladiator arena was found in a fully developed residential area. Less than 10 feet from the entrance of the amphitheater is somebody's house, and a major road just across the street from that. It was discovered in the last piece of undeveloped land in a major Swiss suburb. The arena was built in an abandoned Roman quarry sometime around 337 AD. That makes it the youngest amphitheater in the Roman Empire. It's actually quite strange, because by this time, the Roman Empire was already Already in a major decline and had already outlawed gladiator fighting. It may have had something to do with how far this was from Rome itself, closer to the region of Germania than to the city of Rome. Whoever built the theater probably didn't care too much about Roman rules. The Palace of Zominthos in 1982, Yanis Sakilarakis discovered a two-story building on the Greek island of Crete, built by the Minoans thousands of years earlier. You remember Crete, famous for the Palace of Knossos and the terrifying Minotaur beast in the labyrinth. Here, it is difficult to separate legend from truth. As it turned out, this building was only one piece of a much larger archaeological site. Excavations revealed a massive Minoan palace, and investigations are still ongoing even after 40 years. This was one of the most important palaces in the ancient world. The unique structure is situated on a mountaintop, where it served as a strategic location for centuries. It's the oldest building on the island from the proto-palatial period between 1900 and 1700 BC, which is already super old by our standards, yet it was built on the bones of an even older, unknown structure. It's called the Palace of Zomintos, constructed by the descendants of the Knossos dynasty. This was the cultural, religious, industrial, and administrative center for the island, but it was also built strategically for the rich grazing lands of the surrounding area. It had subterranean hallways, dozens of rooms, winding staircases, altars for worshipping the gods, and indoor atriums. It was also believed to be the location of the birthplace of the god Zeus himself which truly made it one of the most important places of worship. Because it was built so high up on the mountain, it was only accessible during the spring, summer, and fall. The ancient people couldn't even reach their massive palace in the winter months. This place was spectacular, with an advanced drainage system with pipes, large walls, and even a small gold nail which could have been lost or stolen by the Romans. It would have been covered with decorated walls, large corridors, private rooms, atriums, staircases, and workshops. Archaeologists are very excited to see what they find next. Mount Nemrut Mount Nemrut is an archaeological wonder located in southeastern Turkey, in the rolling hills where it was forgotten for centuries. At its peak are enormous stone heads left behind by the kingdom of Comagene 2,000 years ago. These mysterious stone idols were crafted in 62 BC by the decree of King Antiochus I Theos of Comagene. He was the ruler of this small dynasty who wanted to leave an enduring monument that would showcase his greatness for all all the generations to come. He was in a strategic position between the Romans and the Parthians, and he liked to change sides whenever it was convenient for him. 
However, we remember him today for this impressive religious sanctuary he left behind, high up in the mountains. King Antiochus I was greatly inspired by astrology and wanted to be buried as close to heaven as possible. Sitting over 7,000 feet above sea level, the site contains statues of Antiochus himself, measuring 26 to 30 feet high, as well as statues of his relatives and animals. The gods he worshipped were a combination of Greek and Iranian gods, and so the monuments here show both. And, fun fact, it also has one of the oldest representations of two people shaking hands in history. It is Persian Antiochus shaking hands with Greek Heracles as well as with Apollo and Zeus. Up until 1960, the only way to reach the summit of the mountain was by donkey or on foot. And believe me, this was an intense hike. It's believed the king is buried somewhere beneath this mound, but his tomb has never actually been found. For reasons that remain a mystery, some of their heads were removed from their bodies at some point and scattered throughout the site. Based on the damage, it seems as though they were destroyed on purpose. Thousands of years later, this religious site was lost until 1881, when it was discovered completely by accident by a German road engineer. The world's oldest coin mint. In 2021, researchers discovered the oldest coin producing factory in history. The archaeological site is 2600 years old and was once used to produce standardized money. But this money looked nothing like what we think of money today. They did indeed produce coins, but they weren't exactly circular. They were instead shaped like spades or like shovel heads. The bizarre discovery was made in the ancient city of Guangzhou, located in central China. Researchers were shocked when they started digging up finished coins, molds for coins, and pits used for disposing of the casting waste. Radiocarbon dating revealed that minting operations began at this workshop sometime around the year 640 BC. All the clay cores were made carefully with a special measuring tool to make sure each coin was made the same size, with no variations. This was as standardized as it could get, and it was nearly 3,000 years ago. It's hard to really get across how impressive this ancient Chinese coin factory is. The coins likely replaced the shells that had been used for currency during the Zhou dynasty between 770 and 476 BC. While the Europeans were running around with bags of bronze scrap for trade, China actually had a monetary system of standardized coins. However, it all came crashing down in 450 BC, when the factory was abandoned for unknown reasons and the spade coins stopped being minted. The Collapse of Zeta Zeta was once a city in the great empire of Carthage. For hundreds of years, the Carthaginians flourished in northern Africa. They established themselves as masters of trade with colonies throughout the area and were politically dominant in much of North Africa and some parts of the Mediterranean. Zeta's economy was based around the agricultural goods they were able to produce, such as olive oil, which was like liquid gold. But here's something really fascinating. Researchers investigating Zeta were curious to find out why such a successful city was abandoned in the year 200 AD. It had been doing extremely well for itself until war broke out between Carthage and Rome. Rome won. The city fell under Roman control and everything went downhill. What the team discovered is that when the Romans arrived, they forced the local people of Zeta to forget all about their agricultural economy and become industrialized. Archaeological evidence has shown that immediately upon Roman occupation, Zeta shifted from producing olive oil and other sustainable products to refining metal. According to this study, published in the scientific journal Current Anthropology, researchers believe the Romans had Zeta produce massive amounts of iron until they ran out of resources. The way they had been living before was totally sustainable, but the Romans pushed them to their limits. The result was a total collapse of their society and the complete abandonment of their city. That's a way to truly defeat your conquered people. Turkey's hellish spa town. The ancient city of Hierapolis in Turkey was a spa town under Roman control in the year 133 AD. The city boasts some of the most beautiful boiling mineral pools anywhere on the planet. Even just recently, 2.5 million people every year traveled to Hierapolis to take pictures of the limestone cliffs and the mineral springs that formed over 400,000 years ago. The Romans were just 
as impressed by the natural wonder. They turned the town into a thriving vacation destination by the 3rd century. People came from all over the Roman Empire to bathe in the healing waters. But here's the thing, Hierapolis was famous in the Roman world for another reason. Yes, it was a bustling spa town with vacation rentals and a happy, diverse population, but it was also said to be the location of a gate that went straight to hell. The city hosted a portal to the underworld that was inaccessible to the living because it was filled with toxic gas. The Romans believed the toxic gas was the physical breath of the hellhound Cerberus, stationed beneath the ground to keep mortals out. In reality, the poison gas was directly connected to the bubbling mineral pools. The Romans had accidentally stumbled onto a vent spewing out toxic levels of carbon dioxide. Within a few minutes, such concentrated levels could kill a person. But the Romans didn't understand the connection. They saw beautiful pools above and the literal entrance to hell below. Still, it worked in their favor. People came to visit the pools, while religious cults who worshipped the god of the underworld came to give praise to their preferred deity. Tourism won all around. The Lost Norfolk Villages In the area of Norfolk, England, there is about 200 settlements lost to time. Some of these ancient settlements were deserted as well abandoned rural villages and sought out the cities in the Middle Ages. Some were swallowed by the sea because of coastal erosion, and some were evacuated more recently during World War II, with the citizens never bothering to return. Some of the villages don't even have any trace of them left. The only reason we know they ever existed was because of a manuscript called the Domesday Book. The book was completed thanks to an order by William the Conqueror. He wanted a full record of every town in England, and by golly, he got it! The Domesday Book mentions several vanished villages. We have Babingley, a deserted village from the medieval days, and all that remains of it now is a small group of houses near the highway. Then there's Egmere, which was a very large settlement in the 10th century, but was down to only 10 residents in 1428. Nobody knows what happened to it after that, but it seems to have vanished off the map. And finally, there's the deserted medieval town of Godwick. The only thing that remains of Godwick today is a single broken church tower. Everybody walked out in the 16th century, and we have no idea why. Secret Temple Passageways At a mysterious temple complex in Peru, archaeologists have discovered a series of secret, hidden passageways winding deep underground. These passages were found at the Chavín de Huantar Temple, located high up in the Peruvian Andes. What makes these passages so interesting is that archaeologists believe the ancient civilization that built them used them for religious rituals that involved psychedelic drugs. These passages have remained untouched for 3,000 years. The dark and isolated chambers are quite extensive and may have been used to give people a sensory deprivation experience. According to archaeologist John Rick from Stanford University, there are corridors, rooms, chambers, and the whole thing is covered in thick stone beams. We know that Chavín de Huantar was a religious center built by the enigmatic Chavín people, who conquered many parts of Peru and dominated the region for about 1,000 years. This particular place stands over 10,000 feet above sea level and is the largest religious site they ever built. The passages beneath had likely been where worshippers of the mysterious Chavín gods were taken after consuming mind-altering substances. The underground chambers would have given these people an intense hallucinogenic experience. However, nobody actually knows what the purpose of the experience was, or even any real details about the Chavín's religion. Ukraine's Mysterious Pyramid An extremely mysterious pyramid has been discovered in the last place you would expect. Archaeologists in Ukraine recently unearthed the stone foundations of a pyramid-type structure that predates the pyramids in Giza by at least 300 years. What's even more shocking is that the pyramid didn't actually resemble the ones built in Egypt, but looked more like the ones the Aztec and the Maya built in North America thousands of years later. Nobody really knows what to make of this discovery. Victor Klochko, head of the excavation team, described the pyramid as a discovery of international significance. It's the only ancient pyramid ever found in Eastern Europe and could change everything we know about the Bronze Age people here. The best guess researchers have now is that there was some kind of society of worshippers dedicated to the sun, and they built this pyramid as a way of being closer to their blazing deity in the sky. There are actually quite a few structures along with the pyramid, including sacrificial altars sculpted on the hillsides 
and huge complexes of temples. Graves have even been found here with the remains of people who appear to have been burned alive as human sacrifices. We know very little right now other than that we seem to be dealing with a secret pagan cult who came thousands of years before the Slavic people who still populate the region. Dunmore Cave Dunmore Cave can be found just a few miles from Kilkenny City in Ireland. It's a massive cave system that contains hundreds of miles of deep underground passages and chambers. Geologically speaking, the cave is a rare example of when glacial meltwaters form subterranean systems of hollow tunnels and massive caverns. But it's not the geology of the cave that makes it so fascinating. Instead, it's the cave's dark and secret history. About 1,000 years ago, around the year 928, this cave sat in the middle of three major Viking bases. The Vikings lived in Dublin, Waterford, and Limerick. But here in Ireland, the Vikings were not the same kind of united people we think of them as. Instead, they were each a different clan that often clashed with their neighbors and struggled for dominance. They raided the lands, killed pretty much everyone they could, and fought bloody and brutal battles. And that's where the story of the cave comes in. According to legend, the Vikings from Dublin were on their way to destroy the Vikings at Waterford. Ordinary citizens in the surrounding area ran for their lives and hid themselves down in Dunmore Cave. To try and get them out, the Vikings lit massive fires at the mouth of the cave hoping to smoke them out. The smoke was too intense, and everyone who was hiding deep in the darkest corners ended up suffocating to death. Historians have written that roughly 1,000 people died that day, and the Vikings later returned to bury a hoard of treasure amongst their bones. The oldest prehistoric mine in America Archaeologists have just discovered the oldest prehistoric mine anywhere in America. They've been investigating the site since 1986, but it was only recently, in 2022, when they made the big discovery. The mine is located in eastern Wyoming, a place where early prehistoric humans procured red ochre about 13,000 years ago. Red ochre, also called hematite, was a substance used for all kinds of things. Ancient humans used it for bug repellent, as sunscreen, sometimes for medicine, and almost always to paint themselves in ritual ceremonies. It was also incredibly important for their artists, who used it as a pigment when making cave paintings. The site of the ancient mine is called Powers II, and it was in use for at least 12,000 years. The earliest evidence goes back to 12,840 years ago, and the newest evidence from about 1,000 years ago. Excavations have revealed antlers, animal bones, and other tools that had been used to literally scrape the red ochre from the earth. This is a major discovery because never before has a red ochre quarry been found north of Mexico, and only four of them have been found south of the Mexican border. It had boggled archaeologists for a long time because red ochre can be found in almost every burial ground across the Americas, yet nobody knew where they were getting this stuff. Now it seems there was a whole secret operation to extract and distribute it. And what's even more mysterious is that researchers found there were gaps in the times the quarry was used. It was abandoned periodically, with no extraction being done at all. And then people came back and kept on digging. Nobody knows why. The Great Wall of Siberia A great and massive wall has been discovered in the Altai Mountains of Siberia. The wall complex, which has decayed and crumbled so much that it's almost impossible to see with the naked eye, dates back about 2,000 years. It was built around the same time as other fantastic walls of the ancient world, like Hadrian's Wall in the UK and the Great Wall of China. But this wall is almost definitely holding some secrets. First of all, nobody even knew it was there until recently. Only now have researchers discovered rows of stone placed in wall formations by ancient humans. There are at least six rows of fortifications with a total width of roughly 30 feet. It was an absolutely colossal defensive system, and it stretched all along the Katun River. Unfortunately, we don't know who built it. It could have been anyone who lived in the Altai Mountains, like the ancient Pazirik people. It was obviously used for defense, but who were they trying to defend themselves against? All of these questions are incredibly difficult to answer, especially since there is almost no evidence left of the wall. Lost Native American Village in Jacksonville 
University of North Florida archaeology students Victoria Hayes and Kaya Lacey discovered buried treasure as they were digging a small hole on Big Talbot Island. This wasn't buried treasure left behind by pirates, but rather scraps of glazed pottery dating back four centuries to a time when a Native American village was on the island. Specifically, what the students found is called Maholica pottery, and it wasn't crafted by Native American hands, but rather by the Spanish. Researchers believe it had probably been traded to members of the Mukama tribe any time between the 1500s and 1600s. The Mukama lived on Big Talbot Island in the village of Sarah Bay. The place where the students found the pottery was once a council house, but is now nothing but dirt and grass. It was likely the center for life and culture in the village that boasted a population of roughly 100 people. It's the only council house, or large Native American structure, found anywhere in North Florida. While you may think the village came to an end when the Spanish and French arrived in the 1500s, that's not actually the case. Evidence from the island shows that the community thrived about 1,000 years ago, but broke up around the year 1250. That was over 250 years before Europeans arrived. What happened that caused such devastation in the village of Sarah Bay is still a huge mystery. The secrets are either lost forever or still hiding under the soil, waiting to be found. The Tomb of Fu Hao Fu Hao was a warrior queen, one of the most extraordinary women in history who we don't actually know much about. What we do know is that she lived in the 13th century BC in China. She was the royal consort to Wu Ding, the 21st king of the Shang dynasty. She was a fearsome military commander, as archaeologists have discovered through objects found in her mysterious tomb. The burial ground of Fu Hao was found in Anyang, and inside her tomb were ancient artifacts called oracle bones. These were the bones from oxen used in divination ceremonies, and written on the bones was the story of Fu Hao. The oracle bones say that she was royal consort, mother of the heir to the throne, and second in command to the king. It described her as the most important general in Shang history, and said that she led thousands of troops in the battle against the hostile tribes along the dynasty's borders. She was also a woman who participated in sacrificial rituals to appease the ancestral spirits. But she didn't sacrifice chickens or goats, instead preferring to spill the blood of her enemies caught in battle. Fu Hao beheaded men, cooked them in pots, burned them in great pyres, and sometimes even just boiled them alive. This is all based on inscriptions on the ox bones found in her tomb, which happens to be one of the most impressive tombs anywhere in China or in the world. It's hard to say if every last thing is correct, but judging by how many treasures were discovered in her tomb with her, it probably is. Fu Hao's tomb contained over 468 bronze treasures, 755 made from jade, 63 stone relics, 5 items of ivory, 564 artifacts made from animal bone, nearly 7,000 shells, and the list goes on and on. There were mirrors, treasure chests, elaborate knives, enough treasure to give a Viking raider an instant heart attack. The capital of the Huns. Tong Wan Cheng is the only remaining city of the ancient Huns, the people who devastated Europe 1,600 years ago and then vanished off the face of the earth shortly after. The ruins of this place were only recently discovered, and it's been sensational among archaeologists. The thing about the Huns is that they were mostly nomadic and didn't live in great big cities. But considering how massive Tong Wan Chang is, and the fact it was most likely the Han capital, might change our view of their nomadic way of life. The city is in Shanxi province in China and is currently under the threat of desertification. The 1,600-year-old city is slowly being taken over by the sands of the encroaching desert and will probably be gone soon if the Chinese government doesn't work to protect it. Whatever the case, the city is still steeped in mystery. As you might remember, you'll know the Huns began invading Eastern Europe around the first century and caused widespread panic. They pushed the Goths closer to Rome, disrupted the natural order of things, and inadvertently led to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Then they just kind of vanished. Based on their capital city of Tong Wan Cheng, researchers believe the Huns originated in China and then went looking for new lands to conquer after that. The Blue Stone Tracks The great prehistoric site of Stonehenge in England holds many secrets. One of the biggest mysteries archaeologists have struggled to solve over the years is that of the Blue Stones. 
Researchers have always wanted to know where the huge megalithic stones used to build Stonehenge came from and how in the world they were brought to the site. Over the years, a lot of theories and a lot of information has come forward. For example, we know that the blue stones, the first stones raised at Stonehenge, came from a quarry in Preseli Hills, located 140 miles away in the country of Wales. We also know each stone weighed between two and five tons. Seeing as they were erected around 4,000 years ago, it's not like they used heavy equipment to do the lifting. They had to drag these stones from one place to the other by hand. Now, for the first time, archaeologists have identified the actual tracks left behind by the giant stones as they were dragged 140 miles across the ancient landscape. Archaeologists with Oxford University were investigating an ancient Roman road in Wales when they found tracks left behind by the blue stones. The Roman road had once been used to connect villas to fortresses and to allow easy access to silver mines throughout Britain. But what really shocked archaeologists is that the Roman road followed the exact same route prehistoric people took when they moved the blue stones. They essentially built their roads over those ancient tracks. This dispels a lot of conspiracy theories. It seems fairly obvious that aliens didn't build Stonehenge. The tracks in the ground literally show that the giant stones were dragged by a lot of really strong and determined Bronze Age humans. Nothing but ropes, determination, and probably a lot of grunting. The Relics of San Xingdui San Xingdui is another mysterious ancient city in China that holds unknown secrets. It was only discovered recently, but archaeologists have already made countless fantastic discoveries. In the summer of 2022, even more amazing discoveries were announced. A treasure trove of over 13,000 relics was found in San Xingdui, including a sacrificial altar and a mysterious treasure chest built in the likeness of a turtle shell. These relics are made from bronze, gold, and jade, and were supposedly uncovered in sacrificial pits. Here's why the ancient city is so mysterious. The culture who lived here left behind no written records, and so far, not a single human skeleton has been found. They created what was, in 316 BC, arguably the most advanced city in China. Impressive architecture, massive buildings, pyramid structures, unbelievable artwork, and yet no writing system and no human bodies. While we have found their treasures, the question is, where is everyone? Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these, and I'll see you next time. Bye!